In this interview, I'm once again joined by Delson Armstrong, spiritual teacher and star student of Bante Vimala Ramsey. In this interview, Delson recalls tales of unusual spiritual mentors, including an Indian cobbler who taught Delson to read people's karma, unlocking the ability to see not only others' past lives, but also their future fate. Delson engages in a detailed discussion of how to acquire, refine, and master Siddhi, also known as special powers, discusses his own encounters with entities whilst on dark retreat, reveals his experience with the yogas of dream and sleep, and offers advice on dealing with periods of karmic reckoning. Delson also describes the 31 planes of existence, from the Brahma Lokas to the Hell Realms, and shares his opinion on figures such as Mara, Patanjali, and Jesus Christ. So without further ado, Delson Armstrong. Delson Armstrong, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you. It's good to be here. Well, I'm so delighted to uh, be talking with you again. We have quite the menu today of topics to discuss. There's some interesting uh, stories biographically that we're going to cover. And also we're going to talk about a very interesting topic, the 31 planes of existence. <laughs> Wonderful. So let's begin. Now, in our correspondence before this this call, you mentioned that there were actually some other mentors of yours who were really rather interesting, including a cobbler in India who provided you some insight and instruction into reading people's karma, and as well as a man who had 13 near-death experiences. Now, that, both of those men sound very interesting. I'm wondering if you could uh, talk a little bit about those. Yeah. So the first uh, person that you mentioned, the cobbler, uh, I met while I was in Bombay. So I was about, uh, I'd say, just about 16 at the time. This was right before I made my trip to the Himalayas. And uh, it, was a, it seemed like a very chance meeting. Uh, I, I was walking on my way and uh, I, uh, you know, I damaged uh, one of my slippers. So there was a cobbler on the way and I went and saw him and uh, he looked at me and I said, I spoke to him in basically broken Hindi because my Hindi isn't so good. Uh, and he kind of recognized that my Hindi wasn't that great. So then he switched over to English, which for me at the time surprised me uh, because I didn't really expect him to speak such great English. Uh, and, you know, we exchanged pleasantries. We, we talked about this and that, and he asked me where I was from, what I was doing. And uh, I said, you know, I'm just visiting Bombay and I'll be heading, uh, on a trip very soon and uh, he fixed uh, the slipper for me and then that was it really that was a first chance meeting but there was something about him you know his smile his gaze uh, which really intrigued me and especially the fact that he spoke so eloquently while, while we were talking and the subject matter that we were talking about was just you know we were we were just talking we were just talking about the U.S. and India and, you know, relations in the U.S. and India and uh, just very, very general things. But the way he spoke and the th there was something about him, just the way he, he gazed at me that really struck me. So, you know, I really thought about this person. And I was staying with my relatives at the time and I told them about this person. And I said, uh, you know, have you met have you met him because he's in the neighborhood and you know, are you aware of him? And they said, no, we don't know him. And it's nice that you met him. So he was on the way back. He was on the way while I was walking to and fro. So I decided to go and say hi to him again. And we just had a nice conversation and he had a little shack. So it wasn't a full fledged, uh, you know, store, walk in store. It was uh, like a little shack, a wooden shack. And he sat on the ground and he had his tools inside the shack and all of his stuff that he was doing outside and sitting you know, very relaxed. And he said, would you like to sit with me and have a cup of a uh, cup of tea? I said, yeah, sure. So he ordered uh, two glasses of tea for me, uh, one for him, one for me. And we started talking and somehow the conversation steered towards yoga, uh, steered towards uh, spirituality, steered towards meditation. And he had some really interesting knowledge because he was talking about uh, what he called Brahma Gyan, which is really the knowledge of the Brahman, knowledge of the Atma. And I was kind of uh, struck by this. And he talked about 
uh, the Upanishads uh, and the whole Vedanta aspect of it. I, at that time, I was not really aware of what he was referring to because this was before I made my trip and really learned a little bit more about yoga and Vedanta. But it really intrigued me and I wanted to know more. And, you know, so the days went on and I really didn't have a lot going on at the time. So I was preparing for my trip to the Himalayas and I had the chance to see him almost every other day and then eventually every day. And we would just have tea and talk and everything. And one time I was with my cousin, uh, my younger cousin, and uh, he too had uh, damage to shoe. So I said, you know, I know a person who can help. So we went together and then the cobbler, he looked at, he looked at my cousin, just looked at him in the eyes and started smiling. And uh, he did his thing repairing the shoe and my cousin went on about his way and I sat with him and I said, well, what was so, you know, funny? What, why were you smiling at, uh, at my cousin? And he said, well, I see great things for his future. I see some interesting things uh, for his future. So I said, oh, what were you doing? What were you doing? Some kind of base reading or palm reading or something? He said, no, I get a sense of people's karma. I get a sense of where they are and the choices that they've made and where they're headed. And he said some interesting things about my cousin, uh, about things that he, would happen five, down, five years down the road, 10 years down the road. And you know, it actually did happen. A lot of things that he talked about in terms of where he would be, what kind of relationships he would get into, what kind of trouble he'd get into, you know, things like that. And uh, of course, I didn't know it at the time. I didn't have the forethought, the, the foresight to see it. So I, I asked him, uh, how did you, how did you get this uh, Siddhi, right? How did you, how were you able to read people's karma? And he got into the mechanics of it, and he addressed it in the, the Yoga Sutras. And in the Yoga Sutras, what it's, talk, what's, what, what's talked about is how to read your own past lives through samskaras. So samskaras are these impressions in the mind, so to speak. They're like, let's say, you could, the equivalent of that would be the synapses in the brain that carry memory, carry certain kinds of messages around. And the idea is that these formations in the Buddhist terminology, it's known as sankharas or formations as they're usually translated. They are the carriers of karma. They're the carriers of the effects of your previous choices. So he went into some great detail about this and he explained to me, you know, you could do it for yourself, but then you can also look at people and get an impression by placing the mind on their mind. So effectively, reading, let's say, into the thought processes within their mind through a certain technique, and then being able to see what choices they made in the past, and then get a sense of where they're headed in terms of their karma. Now, the interesting thing about karma that he told me is it's not written in stone. So there are three types of karma. He went into the whole theory of it, but basically he said, karma is such that it can deviate, it can change dependent upon a person's decision-making, dependent upon their choices. But there is, there is sort of a trajectory of where that might be headed based on the choices that they made. And that was quite interesting for me. And uh, he, he, did, he did walk me through how it's done and it required very deep meditation, um, which at the time I was uh, wondering if it was even possible for me to do it. But what was interesting was, and, and this is something I reflect on now, was whether it was a result of the meditation techniques that he was making me go through, or whether it was a result of what was happening in the Himalayas. Because while I was in, in the mountains there, we were in the foothills. We were around a place called Rishikesh and uh, Uttarkashi. And I was with my teacher. So one of the things that I experienced amongst some other mystical experiences while I was there was precognition. And it was like, I could almost say it was sort of like deja vu because I would have visions of the next day and what was going on and people that I had never met before and knew what they were going to say, what their names were. And it happened all while I was there in the Himalayas. It was just every single day. 
So there was a point where I met a certain individual and I knew exactly what they were going to say. And I started finishing their sentence, sentences for them. And they kind of got freaked out by that. So uh, I wonder if, you know, if I reflect on it, I think it might have been a result of the meditative practices I did just before going to the Himalayas. But I never really developed it further. Uh, there is a sense of understanding of karma now where you can get a sense when you see a person or talk to them and place their mind, get a sense of what choices they made in the past and how it leads to a certain thing. But it's not something that I, I readily provide to people as a way of teaching because it's quite advanced. And sometimes people don't want to know and it's their right not, not wanting to know what their future holds. Yes, that's fascinating. Do you think this cobbler attained that city um, from past meditative uh, experience or presumably he wasn't entering into these very profound meditative states just instantly whilst looking at your cousin and fixing the sandal or the slipper. So um, could you say a little about about how that works? And also, in terms of your own uh, experiences of city, you mentioned precognition. And uh, I think a lot of meditators do report that uh, coming as one of the first or a, a sense of precognition coming as one of the first um, weird things, you know, that one notices, yeah. especially doing concentration practices. But I think yeah. what you, the level of precognition you're talking about is a little different to what's commonly reported in meditators. Um, you're talking about knowing exact sentences and uh, seeing a whole day ahead of time. That's, I think, much more than um, the common precognition or the sense of precognition that uh, meditators do often report uh, e at even fairly early stages. Um, yeah. It seems. Uh, do, you, do you agree with that? Yeah, I, I, I would say that's a fair statement because uh, I do know of other people who do start out on the meditative journey and they do kind of awaken, let's say, certain cities, including some elements of precognition. Like they get an impression of something that might happen and they get a feeling that an intuitive feeling that maybe I shouldn't be doing this or maybe I should head in that direction. You know, it's it's the intuitive mind, really, the way I look at it, that is being awakened there. And there are other studies that might arise uh, in the form of, uh, you know, being able to kind of know what the person is thinking and being able to kind of read minds, if you will. But yes, I, I would say that uh, to the extent of uh, where one was in the Himalayas and experiencing this, I, I would like to I would like to think that it was probably twofold. One was the, the meditative states uh, that I learned from this particular cobbler along with, I believe, the the energy of the Himalayas. You know, it, it, there is something to be said about going to certain places on this planet, including the Himalayas, where there is a certain sense of coming home, sense of like, I've been here before, and also a sense of like a new awakening in some way or another, you know? Uh, it's like you're living a different life when you go to the Himalayas than you would while you're in the city or whatever it might be. Obviously, the, the most obvious reason is because you're going into the forest and the mountains, but there's the subtle energy, I would say, which, which is uh, impacting the way people experience certain meditative states. And I think now that you mention it, this, this cobbler, he probably had a lot of uh, attainment with meditative states and looking at a person go into a meditative state and then be able to access their, their particular sankharas. Uh, the way he explained it was very interesting. He used an interesting analogy. He said, you know, you think about, and it was very rudimentary, but I, I thought it was a very fascinating analogy. He said, you think about like uh, the way the internet works and the way you connect uh, to a website, you know, there's a certain IP address and you ping that certain IP address and therefore you connect to that in, in that particular web page. So in the same way, if you know, or if you're able to ping a specific uh, IP address of the mind of a certain mind, then you're able to access what they might be thinking as well as their deeper sankaras, which are really the web pages of that particular mind. So that really made sense to me at that point in time, the, what he was talking about. Uh, the meditative states that he was doing, or let's say the meditative practices that he was doing, 
were primarily uh, rooted in Vedanta, as I said, and uh, in the Nath tradition, uh, what is known as the Nath tradition or the Nav Nath tradition, the nine Naths. And the Naths are like basically the Nath yogis that lived in the Himalayas many, many centuries ago. And you have different individuals like uh, uh, Gorakshanath, uh, Matsendra, Nath. It's quite a mouthful to say, but basically Nath means Lord or Master. So they were, these were a specific type of school of yoga that uh, did different practices uh, to attain certain states and to attain certain siddhis. Of course, I, I don't have experience of siddhi, so I have to make a, an analogy to other skills, uh, you know, like, play, for instance, playing a musical instrument, for example, which is something I have some skill in, or even fighting for example, yeah. or physical uh, sports, say. Uh, yeah. At the beginning level, one doesn't have skill, but one might have other uh, attributes like uh, raw power and muscle, for example. You can sort of muscle your way through things. As you become more refined and you gain more skill, you need less uh, muscular power to achieve the same result. You become more efficient. So the power you've got goes further and you can achieve the same as you could before with less with less using less power because the efficiency of the skill is improved and they say the difference between a master guitarist and a mediocre guitarist and i'm afraid in the latter category is efficiency the virtuoso makes it look easy and effortless it's not effortless exactly it's just very right. refined effort you know but yeah. It, it, yeah so i'm curious if it's the same for these sorts of city, when you get the knack for it and you refine the skill, do you need less meditative, raw meditative power? Uh, does it? Do you have to build up a lot of power to acquire the city, and then to break through in some degree, and then afterwards it's a refining of that? Or am I thinking of it um, incorrectly? What's what's the mechanics of that kind of a process of learning, acquiring a new city, for example, and then re right. refining its use afterwards? Yeah. Well, I mean, if you think about Siddhis, yeah, they are certain skills. I think you put it rightly in that sense. And and you think about the way the yoga tradition has been, the Vedic yoga tradition, where you have stories of ancient rishis, ancient seers, who went into the mountains, who went into the Himalayas, and they, they did what they called uh, tapasya. Tapasya meaning producing heat. And so they spent many, 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 many years just to develop this raw meditative power, as you put it. And then that enabled them to awaken certain, let's say, energy centers in their body, like the chakras, if you were to follow the chakra system, or anything else, but basically awakening a certain kind of shakti, a certain kind of energy field that allowed them to access, let's say, higher powers, for lack of a better word, to uh, access these siddhis. So I think initially there is this winding up of energy that's done through a process of meditation, a process of, well, in this tradition or in, in that particular tradition, concentration, concentrating the mind to such an extent that it is super focused and aligned to one object and one objective, because the Siddhi is really the accomplishment. The Siddhi is the fruit of the practice. It's the fruition of the practice. Once you attain the Siddhi, then it does feel like it's effortless because it's not like the second time around, it requires the same amount of effort. There is a, there is, let's say a learning curve, if you will, which is to say, how do I do this? And then there's a level of practice that's involved once you have the Siddhi. So what I'm saying is in the different phases, the first phase would be the preparatory phase, which is the tapasya, which is like raw meditative power that you do for many, many, many years. And then you build up that power and then it awakens something. And I, I, I do say that it is, it is karmic uh, in its effect, which is to say, you know, you, you talk about some certain inborn talents that people have. I see that as being karmic in nature. As I see that as being a remnant of a past life. So it's quite possible that the accomplishment of that city or the attaining of that city is a resultant of previous karmic factors from previous lifetimes, coupled with the effort that one is doing through the process of this 
these meditations. But once it's awakened, then it's a matter of the second phase, which is then accessing that city over and over again, and then being comfortable with it. And then there's the level of mastery, which I see as the final phase, which is you bring it up and you're able to then just use the city. The way I would see it is also in the process of jhanas that we talked about uh, briefly last time, is in the beginning, it seems quite, uh, let's say, not really challenging or difficult, but just trying to get your bearings of what is this jhana that you're in, or what is this level that you're in. But eventually, you get the hang of it, and you start practicing further and deeper, and then you get to a level of mastery where you're able to see every factor to a minute degree of each jhana and each level of meditation. Very interesting. And that has some uh, intriguing possible consequences when we consider the 31 planes of existence, which we'll come to. All right. Uh, can you tell us a bit about the man you met who had 13 near-death experiences? Yeah, this was an interesting one. So I, I spent about about five or six years with this person. Um, so this was back when I was still in New York, uh, New York City, and I was uh, a ghostwriter at the time. So I had uh, just basically got, gotten back to New York, uh, started getting into the film world and screenwriting and ghostwriting and so on. And I heard about this project about this man who wanted to write uh, a biography about himself, an autobiography. So he was looking for a ghostwriter. And he basically said that I've had 13 year death experiences and I'm looking for somebody who can write my story, but more importantly, has some spiritual understanding, some kind of degree of experience in the meditative arts, in the spiritual arts, so to speak. So I signed up for the assignment and, you know, I gave him, a, um, well, he, he got my message. He gave me a call, left me a voicemail and he was in San Diego at the time. That's how I went to San Diego. So I returned the call and uh, we had a good discussion about what my experience was in terms of my writing experience and then spiritual experience. And then the last thing he said before he, uh, we ended the call was, okay, great. So when can you come down to San Diego? And I said, how about this weekend? I think it was around a Tuesday or Wednesday at the time. So he said, how about this weekend? And I said, okay, that's fine. He sent me a ticket and I visited his place uh, in San Diego. At the time, he was living uh, somewhere in uh, Del Mar. For those of for those who might be in, uh, knowing where you know that that might be in San Diego. But anyway, uh, I went and visited him, and he told me his story. And over that weekend, basically, I recorded the whole story, his whole entire life story. And why is it that he had these thirteen near death experiences? And what were those near death experiences? And what happened as a result of those near death experiences? Now, at the time, I was in a different frame of mind. So this was when I was just starting up my career and I was more interested in, let's say, making a name for myself in a writing career and being able to make a little bit of money and so on and so forth. Now, this person that I met, he um, he had a very interesting life. He, he has led a couple of public companies uh, and he has a fairly wealthy lifestyle and so on and so forth. And so at that time, with that frame of mind, I asked him, how is it that you did this? Like, what was it that made you be able to manifest these things? And he said, well, if you want to learn it, why didn't, why didn't you become my protege? And so I asked him, can you be my mentor? And so that was the beginning of our, let's say, six year journey into this. And the 13 year death experiences that he had, so he had them at various stages of his life. The first one he had was when he was very young as a child. Uh, and it opened up uh, what he calls channels and pathways in his mind. And he accessed a different dimension. Uh, according to his description, he accessed this portal and this place where it was very similar to what you would see or hear about different near-death experiences, the commonality being going through a tunnel and seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. And he heard voices and he heard different kinds of voices about, you know, going back uh, to the earth plane and continuing his life. But what he found was when he came back, it, it opened up, as he said, the, the channel pathways to certain kinds of skills 
or let's say certain kinds of uh, assets of personality. For example, as a kid, he developed a great sense of humor and he started to understand how humor opens up the heart, as he said, it, it opens up the heart center because you're able to better connect with a person if you're able to make them laugh and uh, make them feel at ease and so on. And then he, he also had some, let's say, drug experiences as well. At the time, it was, I think, the 70s or 80s. So he, he did some acid trips and he overdosed on cocaine and things like that. So he had different near-death experiences to that. He had a shroom trip, uh, a couple of car accidents, uh, and different kinds of things. And then the 12th near-death experience was very close to where, where we are in the present in terms of the timeline. And what he said was, this time around, when he came back from his near-death experience, what happened here in his 12th near-death experience was, he was in Chicago at the time with his family, and it was August, so it was quite hot, quite, uh, uh, quite humid. And he was trying to change uh, something with the, the pool, the swimming pool, and it was the, the, uh, the chlorine filter or something. And when he opened it up, he inhaled the chlorine gas and it made him go into, you know, arrest, like cardiac arrest or whatever. And then he just had an experience. And when he came back from it, uh, he, what he said was, it was, it felt like a, a bunch of information just downloaded into his mind. And it was like he had connected to the ether. He had finally connected to what he called was the ether and experienced what he called were these principles, like 3,000 principles of life. And it was from, as he puts it, some other kind of, let's say, interdimensional or extraterrestrial uh, intelligence. Um, and, and so it was, it, was, it was a collection of thoughts of wisdom in different facets of life. So I had a chance over that six year period to be able to be mentored in those principles and get a sense of what these principles were all about. And they were related to opening up your, your different chakras and different centers in the spine. They were related to uh, you know, how, to, how to live a life where you're always happy, um, how to live a life in which you are experiencing abundance, not only, let's say, in, in terms of wealth or money, but also in terms of experiences and relationships, emotional connections and things like that. So it was a multifaceted approach to living the best life that you could. So that was, that was a very, very important stage in my life, I would say, those six years to be able to learn from him. And, uh, you know, he, he's still there in San Diego. He's doing his own thing. And he has developed his own, let's say, program or his own methodology of teaching these things. And, uh, you know, he, he and I stay in touch uh, quite often. Um, so I'm, I'm very grateful for those experiences that I've had with. Is he a public teacher? Uh, I would say he's semi-public. I mean, he's open to being able to talk to people openly, you know, uh, I, he has appeared on a lot of different talk shows. Uh, he's appeared on Oprah uh, many, many, many years ago for something else that he's done. So he is okay and comfortable in the public eye. Uh, right now, I think he's repackaging, if you will, those, those elements of teachings that he has and delivering them in a way that's, you know, accessible through the internet and so on. With your experience of different contemplative traditions, do you recognize um, his methodology or the, the, either the principles or the means of exploring them? Do they remind you of any or have any similarities to any other contemplative traditions or philosophies that you're aware of? They do, but with an interesting twist, uh, because he, it was interesting because the information that he received, as he says, uh, is according to him and according to the way he's received that transmission, uh, delivered in a way that is unique in terms of its, its messaging, in terms of the way that it's messaged. But I do find certain connections to Tantra, 
I, I find certain connections to the Siddha tradition. The reason I say that is because this is a very life affirming kind of practice. It's a, it uses energy centers to definitely get into deep states of meditation and to get into deep states of uh, insight and, and wisdom and so on. But it doesn't just stop there. It also talks about what is the best way to live life to the fullest. So I find a lot of similarities in that sense from certain elements of Tantra and certain elements of the Siddha tradition, which is the South Indian yogic tradition, which is all about how do you live in the world uh, while still maintaining some level of higher consciousness. Um, and, and so being both in the mundane and in the super mundane territories. I noticed you haven't mentioned his name yet. Uh, is that <laughs> deliberate? Oh, well, his name is, his name is uh, Greg Halpern. Greg Halpern. You could look him up. Greg Halpern. Wow. Oh, okay. Very interesting. In that story, you, you mentioned uh, various different psychedelic uh, compounds yeah. and also uh, you know, drugs like cocaine and so on that Greg had used. Have you yourself uh, experimented with any psychoactive substances, either recreationally or um, in contemplative contexts? No, actually, I haven't, uh, which is interesting. Um, but I would say I've had similar experiences uh, with reference to how it's described. Um, I don't know if I, we were talking about this before, but I did, I did uh, certain dark retreats uh, where you go into a cave and you're in darkness for like about 40 days or something. And so in this case, the, the practice I was doing was called Kaya Kalpa. So Kaya Kalpa is from the Siddha tradition, which is about, it's sort of like an anti-aging thing. It's actually used primarily for anti-aging, uh, reversing the aging process at the cellular level, at the level of the DNA. And the way it works is you take certain kinds of Ayurvedic herbs and substances. These aren't psychoactive at all. They're rather related to purging the system of certain toxins and things like that. Uh, and then certain kinds of herbs that build up certain tissues in the body or help build certain tissues in the body. So while you're doing that, you're in a period of fasting. Uh, so you're fasting for about, depends upon the length of time that you're there doing the whole program for, but anywhere from seven to 21 days. And so you do this process of fasting uh, and then you go and you start to drink certain kinds of juices and herbal concoctions and things like that. And then while you're in the darkness, the meditative practice is to focus in on the pineal gland. It's really focusing in on uh, awakening what they call is the amrita in the, in, in the brain, in the mind. So there's actually a process called um, Kechari Mudra, which is in Kriya Yoga. You take the tongue and you access uh, a certain thing over the nasal palate. And then it, you, you taste some, certain kind of bitter and salty kind of substances, and eventually it's, it's sweet to the taste. So uh, along with that, you then focus in as best as you can to that location of the pineal gland, and it awakens the light with, within, so to speak. And you get certain kinds of very interesting experiences and i would say they're probably just hallucinations and they're probably hallucinations as powerful and as strong as let's say dmt or an acid trip i couldn't tell you from experience but i could probably say they're probably very similar hmm. very interesting experiences and hallucinations of lights and uh, entities and landscapes well, entities yeah yeah lights and entities like i i saw certain kinds of uh, interesting entities like uh serpent-like entities, which I would say are the Nagas, um, and then other entities like, you know, uh, it's very funny, but like they look like wizards, if you were, you know, they kind of look like you, but with longer beards, you know, and uh, they're basically, I would say, the rishis or the ancient yogis. And, and that. so I look at these as probably archetypes of the mind that you're accessing and then downloading certain kinds of wisdom and information through that process. Did you interact with those uh, entities at all during that dark retreat? Yeah, I did. I did. I, there was a, 
it was more of like, let's say a t- telepathic connection. So it was like, I would see these entities in front of me and some of them were also like gray aliens. So they look like grays and then other kinds of other entities. So I would interact with them and it was more on a mind to mind level. And there would be certain kinds of insights that you would get about the emotional body, insights about uh, you know the physical body, insights about what you should be doing or should not be doing in terms of your own uh, life path, if you will. Uh, and then there was this experience of this interconnectedness, uh, a sense of like a holographic nature of the universe that the, the, the cell or the atom contained within it all of the elements and building blocks for an entirely new universe. So it was quite the trip, you know, no pun intended, but it was really interesting. Okay, before we get on to the 31 planes of existence, I'd like to ask you a bit about sleep. Sleep. Yeah. Now, David Johnson, uh, who uh, viewers of the last episode or listeners of the last episode will, will recall introduced us, mentioned that you don't sleep much, actually. Yeah. And uh, I'm curious then, what is your experience of sleep and how has it changed? Um, and in particular, has sleep, has the awakening of various insight stages, uh, stream entry and beyond, uh, affected your experience of sleep? Yeah, that's, that's, uh, it's an interesting experience now, because the way I envision sleep, or I look at sleep now is just a, pr- a physical process. So when we talk about the various stages of sleep, um, I'm able to just be conscious of them. So I know that, for example, the mind is now getting into, uh, you know, an REM phase, or it's getting into a deep sleep phase. And so there is a level of mindfulness now in this mind, which is able to be, let's say, alert or awake, even while asleep. So the purpose of sleep in this case, I, I look at is just rest for the body and uh, certain regenerative processes that the body has to go through at the level of the cells. But on the mental level, or let's say on the subjective experiential level, I'm still aware of being awake while, let's say, in deep sleep as well. And the way I look at it is it is it is a fulfillment of the understanding in the one of the Upanishads. It's either the Manduka or Mandukya. I always get confused by it because they're so similar sounding. But it's an interesting one because it talks about the secret of the syllable Om, you know, and what it says is you have the three syllables that make up Om. You have A, U, and Ma. And what these represent really are the waking state, the dream state, and the dreamless deep sleep state. But it talks about a fourth stage, which is called Chaturya, which is shortened to the Turiya stage. And that is the silence uh, beyond the Om, which is aware of these different states within the experience of Om. So the way I would equate that is an experience of Turiya, being, let's say, always on, uh, you know, never really sleeping. And this was also found, as we talked about a little bit about the research last time, which was when I was in that sleep uh, cycle, they didn't see indications within the brainwave reading showing that the mind had actually gone to sleep or the brain had gone to sleep where it was unconscious. There was still a level of mindfulness. And so that's why one of the researchers, when they came in, they actually asked, were you actually asleep? Because we couldn't see uh, what was going on. It it seemed like you were still awake. There was still some alertness uh, through that 90-minute cycle. And why is it that this transformation of sleep which sounds you know we compare if i compare it to myself for example you know um i have very conventional sleep often i don't remember my dreams in fact despite attempting to occasionally so i i think i'm pretty baseline why would that change of consciousness compared to say a baseline uh person um re- mean you could sleep less uh, in fact how much do you sleep on average or how much do you think you'd need if you had to you know, guess and how much do you sleep and, and why why is this change 
meant that you can sleep less than say a baseline person? Right. Well, I'll say one thing. Um, there have been occasions or more than let's say occasionally where I've been able to go without sleep for two or three days and still be okay, uh, still be functional. And, you know, one time, um, as I was explaining to you, when I first met Bhante Vimalaramsi uh, in San Francisco or close to San Francisco, uh, they had invited me to come and see him. Um, and so at that time, I was still working uh, in San Diego and I wasn't, I wasn't asleep for about two days. I took a short nap and then did a little meditation and then went on the plane to go and see them. So I hadn't had much sleep at that time, but uh, if you were to ask them, there was just, you know, continuous joy and, you know, togetherness in terms of the mind and collectedness and good energy. And I think one of the reasons if I was to contemplate and understand why is this the case, it's because you come to a certain level in the mind where it's very efficient in the way it processes information. It's very efficient in the way it takes that information and doesn't further proliferate. So it just sees things as they really are without any kind of judgment on them, without any kind of holding on to them, without any kind of craving or aversion or any of those reactions to it. It's just taking that information. And because the lack of those reactions, there's not a lot of energy expenditure in the mind. So I see sleep, let's say on the baseline level as being needed for those who need it to be able to process the information that they've had throughout the day, and then be able to consolidate memory and so on. That's one element of sleep along with the physical regenerative processes. So on average, I'd say I do have uh, about six or seven hours of sleep. But again, the quality of sleep for me is different in the sense of uh, at least my subjective experience is that I'm still awake during those six to seven hours in this, in, in so far as being in this meditative awareness. And I, I rarely ever dream. Um, the way I explain the way I experience REM and the dream state and the deep sleep state is basically how you would experience neither perception nor non-perception uh, where certain things are happening, but it's like the sankharas, the samskaras are there present and you can notice them. And then the deep sleep state is where it's like a level of nothingness. It's a complete blank, but there is still consciousness there. There's still awareness of that nothingness. The Dalai Lama is quoted as saying that one of the uh, highest yogic attainments is to be able to do exactly as you're describing, to retain awareness uh, throughout the entire arc of sleep. So that's quite a remarkable, a remarkable report. Another aspect of um, yogic sleep, you mentioned you, you don't dream very often, is, uh, should we say, lucid dreaming. Sometimes, and perhaps I think this is perhaps a lesser attainment than what you're describing, but the idea being that in the dream state, uh, very often we are we believe the dream is real. Uh, we we act as yeah. if it's being re re real. You know, I recently dreamt I was Ma uh, Matt Damon being chased by uh, several uh, thugs with machine guns, right? And I really thought I was Matt Damon. And the faster I walked, the slower <laughs> I went. The faster I ran, the slower I went. It's like that kind of a dream. Anyway, and of course, uh, it's silly now to say it, but at the time, you know, I was really running as fast as I could and was quite disturbed right. by the fact that right. I was getting slower and slower. So, uh, but of course, th that's a corollary, uh, uh, rather, there's a correlation that's sometimes pointed between that, uh, if you want, ignorance of what's really going mm -hmm. on and the um, being, if you want, a uh, believing the dream of when I'm awake, the dream right. of my own uh, delusions and so on misinterpretations. Yes. So I'm curious if uh, you um, went through a phase or if you're able to dream consciously. And of course, advanced dream yogis can use different types of, of lucid dreaming for different things, such as we mentioned precognition. Well, certain times of the night, for example, one can access precognitive dreams or right. um, dreams of um, meeting uh, teachers, for example, or past masters or 
uh, etc. I'm, I'm thinking now of, of, of the accounts of masters such as Namkai Norbu, uh, for right. example, who used lucid yeah. dreaming to, you know, to, to, to commune with his, his teachers, uh, alive and de uh, dead, actually, even alive yeah. ones, they can meet in the dream. This is some of the things that are claimed by these dream yogis. Right. So um, did you experience anything like that? Uh, could you do that if you wanted to, even though you don't dream much now? Um, what can you say about dreams uh, from a yogic point yeah. of view? Well, you know, there was, uh, I just want to make a little comment about that, just trying to connect to what you were saying, which is, you know, there was, uh, he's passed on now, but uh, there was a, a bhikkhu, uh, a very, very wise, uh, venerable, um, named uh, Punaji. And actually, he was uh, one of uh, one of uh, Bhante Vimaramsi's friends. He actually even visited him, uh, Damasuka, while he was still alive and so on. And he had an interesting comment. He said, you know, when you experience certain levels of attainment, it's like awakening from the dream of existence. So to connect to that, I mean, how, what's to say that we're not dreaming now, right? I mean, there is a level of dream-like experiences that people have where it's these projections of what they think reality is. It's projections of the concepts of this is how things should be rather than seeing as things as they actually are. So that's just a comment I had about that. But I think when it comes to, you know, things like dream yoga and things, I think, you know, I probably did that on an, un, let's say, unconscious level or kind of stumbled into it in the beginning while I went to the Himalayas. So I, I believe the precognition that I experienced happened as a result of what I dreamed or, you know, whatever I was seeing in the night happened in the day. So certain elements, certain people that I saw, certain places that we went to, certain experiences we had was all there in the dream. And one was lucid of that. And then when that experience happened, recollecting what that was. So it's sort of like a deja vu, if you will, but to a point where you're you're, you're completely lucid of this experience. And obviously, as I just had indicated some time back, that you can actually know what the person's going to say and then be able to complete their sentences and so on. So I think I stumbled into that experience, but I consciously haven't done any kind of experiences with uh, dream yoga uh, to that extent. I have done a little bit of lucid dreaming here and there before, a long time back, but uh, not to this extent. Something that's often reported in, should we say, tales of yogis, and, um, and, I, and I, I use that term broadly, um, is uh, periods of karmic reckoning or mm. karmic uh, purification or karmic uh, accounting of some sort, you know. Yeah. Sometimes that's, uh, it could be periods of hardship uh, or a physical illness, for example, mm -hmm. or various mm -hmm. other. Uh, <clears throat> can occur and are seen to be or interpreted as, uh, as some sort of karmic reckoning, uh, perhaps from past lives or, or whatever the case may be. I'm curious what if you have a take on that. And if you've ever experienced any, any period of karmic reckoning or karmic purification of that of that of that classic type that one occasionally does hear about? Right, right. So yes, I would say, you know, um, you think about karma, and if you'll indulge me, I'll just give a little bit of understanding of the theory of karma from the yoga perspective. Uh, we have three types of karma. We have what is known as sanchita karma, prarabdha karma, and agami karma. And the way it's understood is the sanchita karma is basically all the karma that you have, let's say, inherited from past lives and are now being accounted for in your choices and your actions. And the agami karma is those fulfillment or the reckoning of that. And then the prarabdha is what is allotted for you in this particular lifetime. So it's basically your fate or your destiny, things that are basically unavoidable in one way or another. They, they cannot be avoided, but they can be mitigated in one way or another. So, the understanding is that at a certain point, when you have a certain level of awakening, the sanchita and the agami karma are eradicated, but there is still prarabdha karma to be played out. 
because that is the karmic fuel for this life. So that entails how long this life will continue on for or give an indication of how long you know, the biological life will be and what certain kinds of situations will be experienced uh, as a result of that karma or an effect of that karma. So the yogic understanding, and this is what was taught to me, at least, the theory of that is that you have packets of karma in one lifetime. And these packets uh, vary in terms of every five years, every seven years, every 10 years or every 12 years, depending upon the tradition. But basically what it's saying is around these times with that kind of reckoning, certain things happen. There's like an unfolding, an unpacking of karmic baggage. And that can be both good and bad. So it has mixed results. So sometimes uh, certain things will propel you to go places because of situations. And that's karmic in nature. I mean, everything in this life is really karmic in nature. Every choice and intention we make is producing a karmic result to be experienced in the future. And the choice that we make now is influenced by karma from a previous action made before. So the understanding is this karmic reckoning is very much experienced by everybody, but yogis are more aware of it. Yogis, again, being very broad term uh, meditators or let's say people who are in tune with this. And so I've had my fair share of that. Uh, you know, I've been only here 31 years in this particular life, but I've had my fair share of that starting, uh, you know, at the age of, uh, I'd say the age of 15 or 16, which actually propelled me to go to the Himalayas. It was that disillusionment, that disenchantment with the world. And, you know, just, just looking at the world and not really satisfied by it and then taking my journey and, and experiencing certain things. And then also experiencing uh, sickness. Uh, you know, when I was, uh, and this could be a result of having been in the Himalayas and, you know, all the other things. But coming back, I experienced uh, a terrible bout of uh, jaundice uh, to the point that I was really, you know, almost dying. Uh, like I had lost a lot of weight. I had become almost skeletal. And so I consider that to be part of that karmic reckoning. So the, the, the unpacking of the cognitive or the precognitive experiences, uh, the unpacking of experiencing, you know, these different masters and teachers and different traditions while in the Himalayas, coupled with, you know, the, the, the medical condition that I had coming back from the Himalayas, I take all of that to be an unpacking of a certain package of karma. So the karmic reckoning. And then it happens at later st stages as well, where other things happen. You know, you lose your job or you lose a family member or you get div uh, divorced or whatever it might be uh, for people. It propels them to think about their lives. So there is something to be said about the importance of these events. You, you can either choose to see them as why is this happening to me? And, you know, being very uh, self in a, in a, in a self pity mode, or you could see it and say, okay, what is the lesson here? And what is the direction now that this life wants to go in? What are the choices that are available to me? If you change your perspective on that, then you can actually start to make certain choices that are rooted in wisdom, rooted in self-compassion, rooted in, uh, more wholesome qualities that lead you and at the very least mitigate, let's say, the negative aspects of the unpacking of that karmic life. And so then you are more in alignment with your intuitive mind. And by doing so, you you have a better management of how to travel around this particular karmic unpacking. Could you give an example of... Uh... A, a more wise or compassionate choice in, in re relationship to such a packet of karma? Yeah, I mean, I could give a, I could give a very general example. Let's see. Uh, if you think about it, like, you know, somebody, somebody gets fired from their job and they, they, and at the same time, they get divorced. And at the same time, uh, they lose their house. And at the same time, they lose a parent. And, and so it's just, 
like what is happening here you know is god cursing me or is this my fate and so on and so forth that could be one way of looking at it but another way of looking at it is really starting to contemplate why did you lose that job was it because you could seek to do something uh, that you've always wanted to do perhaps the job that you had uh, was not satisfying or it was not in leading in a direction that you wanted to go in your career now you have a level of freedom to make a choice dependent upon the, 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 the choices before you. The relationship that was uh, broken, you know, perhaps uh, you could look at it in a way that, you know, this frees you up from the responsibilities or the expectations of a partner. Uh, and now you can really start to make decisions for yourself without having to think about that particular individual and taking into account, you know, their choices and their concerns and so on. So now you're only thinking for yourself and now you have a level of freedom in that sense. So what I'm saying is basically it's a level of, it's a change in the level of perspective of how you view these things. Uh, you know, losing a family member, losing a loved one, losing a friend, that's always a terrible thing. But the understanding can be that it propels you to reflect on their own life. You can reflect on their own life and see the wonderful qualities that they had and be able to imbibe those qualities in yourself. So they live on, so to speak, through those qualities, through what you've developed in your own mind. And then, of course, on the more, the, uh, on the more general level of spirituality and insight and wisdom, you have a certain level of understanding of the impermanence of conditioned existence. So these could be choices or perspectives that are rooted in wisdom and compassion and understanding. Thank you, very interesting. So I'd like to ask you now about the 31 planes of existence. And these have been presented by teachers in various different ways and understood in various different ways. Often actually one sees them uh, popularly as sort of metaphors for psychological states an almost Jungian um, or psychological interpretation. Um, but that's actually not exactly how you describe them. You describe them as places that we can actually go um, and experience, you know, e eons of torture or eons of, of Janic bliss or whatever the case may be. And it also, when you have talked about them, you do sound rather like you, you've been there. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if that's the case or not, but you do seem to talk, it's, it, you have the sense of first-hand experience. Now, I'm not sure if that's the case, but maybe that's just my impression from the way you talked rather confidently about it. You know? And so can you tell us what are the 31 planes of existence? And is it possible for you to contextualize, contextualize this teaching before we get into the details in terms of your own experience? Yeah. So, so first I want to say, you know, a lot of times uh, people will have a reaction to understanding 31 planes of existence and understanding it as being, okay, these are different planes of existence. And so you've been here before and so on. But then that's just another belief system. And that's just another thing I have to kind of buy into in order for me to do the practice. And what I say is, no, you don't need to. You don't even need to think about rebirth or that there are planes of existence and so on for you to be able to benefit from the meditative practices. So I wanna just say up, up front about that is that people you know, who want to try meditation and uh, you know, specifically let's say jhana practice or, or, or the twin practice, they don't need to believe in anything. And that's really the heart of the Dhamma in terms of the Buddha's message, like come and see for yourself. We're not asking you to buy into anything. Check it out for yourself. Now, when it comes to the actual 31 planes of existence, uh, you look at it from a couple of angles. One is, yes, I do see them as psychological states. So in one life, you can experience the 31 planes of existence at the level of mentality. If a person is somebody who has a very, let's say, greedy or stingy mindset it's very much similar to what is described as a hungry ghost never always never satisfied but but always hungry you know or somebody who has a very aversive hateful mind is someone who is you know likened to a being in a hell realm 
tortured by their own thoughts of hatred, tortured by their own thoughts of aversion. Similarly, if somebody is more sense-based, let's say, somebody who's more attached to the body, attached to uh, sex and food and all these other things with bodily pleasure, quite possible that they're very animalistic in nature, you know? Uh, and then you get into the human plane, of course, but then you get into what is known as the six sensuous heavens. And the way it's understood in the texts is that in order for you to get to these states, you don't need to be practicing meditation. Uh, you only need to be developing a virtuous mind. So that is to say, in the Buddhist context, keeping the precepts, uh, you know, having generosity, developing to some extent the, the, the paramis uh, in terms of benevolence and loving kindness and generosity and gratitude and so on and so forth. And the reason is because these kinds of states of mind are very much psychologically similar, if not the same, as the devas in the deva planes, as the devas in the six sensuous heavens. Now, when you get into, for example, uh, the idea of the being that's known as Mara in Buddhism, you know, in certain, in certain light, he's seen as this sort of satanic devil figure that tempts meditators and things like that. But that's not the way I see him. He is just another deva uh, who, who's sort of a re rebel in that particular plane, and he has his own posse, if you will. And his ideology or his idea of the world is that everybody should be within the sensual realms. So don't go into jhana. Don't go into practicing meditation. Don't do this. It's a waste of time. We're here to enjoy ourselves. We might as well enjoy ourselves. That's the mindset that he has. So his intentions are to bring people down from their lofty goals of attaining certain kinds of states of meditation for the sole purpose of saying, if they, they go away, they're no longer populating the sensuous heavens. And so I have nobody else to hang around with. I don't have anybody else to stick around and have fun with. That's one way of looking at it. And so Mara is in that sense, a tragic figure because he doesn't realize that there is more beyond this, or even if he does, he's not interested in that. Now I say he, but, it's not necessary that he's male or female. He could be androgynous, but whatever that might be. But I'm just saying he, because that's what's traditionally understood, that Mara is a male figure. But there is a psychological com component to Mara as well, where you have uh, jealousy and you have certain kinds of traits where you see other people succeeding and you don't want them to succeed just because you know, you're either jealous or uh, you want them to still be at the same level as you do. And I, I equate that as an analogy of you see crabs when they're in water, when they're in a pot of water, they try to grab onto the other crabs, you know, so that they don't get out of, they don't escape. So in the, the Brahma Lokas, the, they are equated with the jhanic factors. So that means you have the first four jhanas um, and they are equ equated to those mind states. So in the Brahma planes, you have the experience of, in the first level, great amounts of joy. There is great amounts of joy and comfort and bliss, and it's just very energetic and vibratory. Then you have the second level, which is associated with the eradication of mental uh, proliferation in the way of Vitaka and Vichara. So, and that means that there is still some joy, there is still some bliss. And then in the third, it's like there is just the sukha. Sukha is like this comfort, this very pleasant, tranquil happiness. And then the fourth level is just complete balance. And there is complete equanimity and tranquility there. So the mind states of individuals who live in these Brahma realms, in these Brahma lokas, are basically the same as those you would experience in a jhana, dependent upon what jhana you're experiencing. And, and so they're, they're just uh, experiencing, let's say, the fruition of that practice, the fruition of being in that jhanic state. And how it's commonly understood is that 
when you have a certain level of mastery of a certain jhana, you get to a certain level, a sub-level within these Brahma planes. So if you're able to get into the first jhana very proficiently, then you experience being the Mahabrahma or another type of Brahma within that realm. Same for the second, third, and fourth jhana. Now the Arupa, which means the formless realms, are quite interesting because there, there's no form there. There's no experience of a body. So what we're saying here is in the sensuous realms, which include the hell realms, the hungry ghost realms, the uh, animal realms, the human realms, and in the six uh, sensuous heavens, they all have a body that is able to experience the different sense pleasures as well as pain. Now, what I would say is when you talk about the hell realms and you talk about the sensual heaven realms, the nervous systems are different. So you could say that the karma of whatever was there in the previous life actually produces the nama rupa, the mind and body for that next experience or that next life. And that also includes the nervous system. So in a hell realm, the nervous system there is geared to experience more pain and they experience time in a different way. Likewise, in the sensuous realms, their nervous system is geared to experience more pleasure, much more easily. Now, in terms of the Brahma realms, there's what they call the luminous form. So there is still some kind of form, but it's a form that is not exactly, let's say, physical completely. There is some kind of form that is luminous because there's light, it's a light body, so to speak. It's an astral body in another way of understanding. But in the formless realms, there's no, there's no form at all. So what it is, is it's almost like your disembodied consciousness experiencing those four Aruba jhanas, depending upon where you are at. So we have the four Aruba levels, which are infinite space, infinite consciousness, nothingness, and neither perception nor non-perception. And in infinite space, all that is, is an experience of vast expansion. There is a sense of limitlessness to what you're experiencing in the way of a body. So the way I would equate it is, it's like you are the entire galaxy or you are the entire universe experiencing all of that space at that same time. Consciousness is the awareness of being in that infinite space, but then it breaks down into individual arising and passing away of consciousnesses. And the analogy I use for this is, you think about a ray of light and how it seems like one fluid ray of light, but in reality, it's actually trillions and trillions and quadrillions and quintillions of photons that make up those, ind those individual photons that make up that ray of light. So the awareness uh, in infinite consciousness is broken down into those very fragmentary elements. And indeed, you actually experience that on the level of the jhana, the arupa jhana of infinite consciousness. Nothingness is where it's a perception of nothingness, meaning there comes a point where you experience the gaps between the arising or the, the passing away and the arising of a next consciousness. So it slows down to such an extent that you see the gaps. And the way you can analogize that is you think about like the old films that you used to watch in a movie theater and you slow down the film reels, you start to see the individual frames and you start to see the gaps between one frame and the other. That gap, the experience of that gap is really the experience of nothingness. So here there is still some kind of contact, feeling, perception in the way of experiencing nothingness, but that's all happening in the mind or in the mentality. There's no rupa, there's no physical form there. And then finally, neither perception nor non-perception. The very interesting state to be in, the way I equate it is, we call, we call that in, in the twin understanding as quiet mind, or it's a signless state of mind, which is to say that there's nothing going on, but there is still a level of awareness. It's a, it's a level of the sense of I am. So there is that conceit of I am that's there. But there's no intention going on. There's no other contact, feeling, or perception. Just this very broad sense of I am 
And so it's very much equivalent to the experience of what we were talking about last time, which is the asmita samadhi, the sense of the samadhi where I am, I am, I just am. That's it. I am. I am not this. I am not that. There is just the sense of I am. And you go beyond that and there's the experience of uh, rikpa in the sense of this primordial awareness, this awareness that's pristine, this awareness that is empty, or there is an understanding that it is not self. It's empty cognizance, which is to say there is awareness, but there is no identification with that awareness. So in that case, when beings are there, uh, they're experiencing basically I am. That's it. That's all they're experiencing. They, there is a sense of existence, a sense of self there, that I am present. And then at the very last moment, there is an intention that arises based on the intention that arose prior to having taken birth, so to speak, in the realm of neither perception or non-perception. And so that intention then guides rebirth into the next plane or the next existence that they are to experience based on the intention, which is those karmic formations. So this is just a broad sort of outline of the 31 planes of existence. Now, within that, there's some really interesting things like the entities that we talked about earlier. You have the Nagas and you have magical beings and mystical beings and things like that, which happen at this level where it's be it's between the earth plane and one of the the Tawatimsa, the gods of the 33, as they're understood. So all of the archetypes that we understand in terms of like gray aliens or wizards and elves and leprechauns and other things that people experience when they're on, you know, different kinds of psychedelic journeys, that's really experienced here at this plane. And so these archetypes can be experienced at the mental level, but there is an understanding that they are also quote unquote physical because they are present as their own separate existence. And the way I would describe the planes of existence is like the spectrum of light. So it's all one level, so to speak, but it's just different parts of the spectrum of that light. So that's, that's really the way I would describe it. Well, that's very interesting. So we have 11 Kama Loka, or these sensuous realms generally, 16 of the Rupa Lokas for the four, the four Janas, if you want, with their four subdivisions, as you, as you mentioned, and then the Arupa Loka, four of those, that makes the 31. Um, remarkable. Or perhaps we could talk, I mean, we could talk about a lot of things there, but it, it's, <laughs> it's, I think it's striking that your um, description of those uh, realms uh, could, is, is basically Jana description also you, you know you're, you're making that comparison all along the way and while i said before that you don't present them typically as psychological states you've included that so you're saying that there they could be thought of both as psychological states or as actual locations that one can, can right. end up in you know like going to amsterdam or going to new york or so um, yeah. and uh, also that um uh, they, they can be seen as it can be seen as a sort of a janic progression in a certain sense that one might go right. through in one's practice. Yes, so the, the sort of different interpretations. Is that fair to say you're you're you're, you're shading in all these different interpretations uh, at the same time? Is that fair? That's right. I would say that's fair. Well, let's talk a little bit about the entities then, as we did mention them earlier, and you're bringing them up here again. You know, uh, you've mentioned psychedelic. Uh, use can uh one of the things that people can encounter in, in, in particular psychedelics particularly as you mentioned dmt and things of that nature uh it has been reported and people encounter entities a sense of other a sense of that's not just a, a part of my mind this is you know that's a that's a wizard there yeah <laughs> okay there's yeah. some you know <laughs> some interconnectedness of all beings and so on but that's that's an actual you know rishi <laughs> floating yeah. there um yeah and any resemblance to me, of course, is, is entirely uh, coincidental. But, um, <laughs> but other people, as you mentioned, you know, you access that sort of thing in dark retreat. And some yeah. people I know have reported, in fact, even on this podcast, accessing uh, or having such experiences through meditative techniques such as casino practice, fire casino practice, which seems to stimulate mm -hmm. somehow the, 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 the visual perceptual faculties to some degree, given as it is a very visually oriented meditation style and and get you into high states of concentration that's 
one of his objectives. Also, however, people who have, um, we would uh, perhaps in Western medical uh, view would see as having mental illnesses, uh, mm. schizophrenics, mm. for example, or uh, those that have psychotic breaks, for example, also can experience um, entities or uh, the, yeah. have experience of entities, subjectively speaking, which can be uh, for some of them uh, neutral, for some of them positive and, and, and oftentimes negative and disturbing. And also, um, I myself have met people who've claimed to be able to perceive uh, all sorts of beings and entities just naturally. They didn't get there through psychedelic right. use. They didn't get there through fire casino or dark retreat or anything like that. They're quite functional people in all regards, but they see angels uh, everywhere, for example. Uh, I've met yeah. people like that and uh, talked to them about it, and they seem to see them just the same way I, you know, I'm looking at you here on a Zoom screen. Then perhaps the final thing I'll say is, of course, many traditions, including where I come from in Scotland, there are many warnings against consorting with or interacting with um, trow, for example, or selkie. These are sort of uh, denizens that are said to lurk around the sort of place where I come from in Scotland, very north of Scotland. And uh, for various reasons, uh, little people, etc. It said, um, right, right. Uh, the story goes something like this. You see them, it's very appealing. There's nice music and there's a lot of dancing. You start dancing and then you can't stop dancing. And then they take you <laughs> under the hill and you'll never see your parents again. Or you're walking along the beach at a certain time of night in a certain phase of the moon and you see a very attractive uh, figure. Oh, you and you become very entranced by them and they seem really attractive. And it turns out mm. this is a selkie. They've become a person for a period of time, but now they're going to take you under the sea and you'll never see your parents again. All of the stories that I heard anywhere right. ended up with that threat. You'll never right. see your parents again. Anyway, so <laughs> do you have a view on that? Can you explain a little about these entities and uh, the means of, of, of perceiving them and how should one relate to them? Should one follow the example of the old uh, folk around where I came from and just avoid <laughs> or uh, of course, we also hear many stories of yogis interacting with certain beings, uh, even right. teaching certain beings like Nagarjuna, for example, you know, teaching them or uh, receiving blessings from them or and so on and so forth. So what advice would you have for the um, traveler of these realms and those who might experience them through all the various different means that it's possible to do so? Yeah, yeah, that's a good uh, that's a question. I think number one, um, you know, one of the guidances about this is you want to develop a very good control. And what I mean by control is a good level of mastery of a specific jhana. And we're talking really here about the fourth jhana before you start delving into these kinds of things. The reason being is because the, that, that allows the mind to be very tranquil, very balanced, and very equanimous. So whatever it is you might encounter. Now, this is also uh, a point of guidance for when you want to access previous lifetimes as well in your rebirths. Because... You might not like what you see when you see previous rebirths. So uh, it gives a level of clarity and understanding and equanimity so that if you do encounter these beings, uh, you don't get uh, you don't get afraid, you don't, you know, you, you don't get startled and things like that. Because I have uh, known of individuals who've tried to access, for example, Patanjali, you know, the founder of yoga. And, uh, you know, the way Patanjali is uh, depicted in the statues, uh, if you've ever seen it, is sort of this half man and half snake kind of body. And that's to say that's a very nice interpretation, a softer interpretation of what you would probably experience. Because according to this individual, when they saw Patanjali, it, you know, scared the hell out of them. It was like, wow, okay, I, I don't want to access this anymore. So I, I would caution, I would caution people, if you don't have an experience of some level of balance and tranquility and equanimity, don't go for these things. So, so first develop that. And then if you are interested in accessing these realms, do it for the right reason. And what I mean by that is going back to the understanding of, let's say, the suttas, of why certain monks did it or certain individuals did it, including the Buddha himself. 
he went through these different realms because he was trying to understand karma even better. He basically was trying to understand how is it that you ended up in this particular uh, physical plane or uh, this particular realm? What are the actions, the intentions and thoughts that led you there? So the reason why yogis would do this is to understand, you know, what, how does karma play out so that people take birth in these experiences or the, 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 the rebirth occurs where now the formations, the samskaras or the sankaras now transport a new consciousness into these particular realms. Now, as far as for the tales that you were talking about from, from, uh, uh, Ireland, I'm sorry, Scotland. Uh, you know, I would say it's an interesting thing because you hear a lot of similarities in terms of these stories. So, for example, you know, I talk about, uh, let's say, the Tawatimsa heavens, which are the gods of the 33. And the gods of the 33 are basically in the Hindu and Buddhist uh, mythology. Indra and Varuna and Agni and Mitra and all of these different gods. But what you see is they're archetypical, right? They're archetypal in the sense of they're talking about also the same, the same kinds of gods in Norse mythology or in Greek mythology or any other kind of, let's say, Indo-European mindset. So could it be that it's just an offshoot of a proto-culture? which is, you know, one of the theories of proto-Indo-European culture, or could it be that there were certain shamans, certain yogis, proto-yogis, who accessed these different realms and saw the same thing, but their culture interpreted in a certain way. And yet you see still significant similarities between these different individuals uh, that are described in the different traditions. So I think there is something to be said about that. Like there is the similarities can't just be, you know, considered coincidence. I think there's something greater there in the sense of people having seen it for themselves. And then the stories, you know, get passed down and sometimes they can be interpreted in one way or a different way. And, you know, then they, they become children's stories, as you said, and it's, it's a warning for children not to, you know, go out into the dark and make sure that you're staying with your parents and so on. So you know, I think, I think the access to these planes have provided some level of richness to the different traditions that we have. Even in Native American cultures, they have their own stories, which have certain similarities to the Indo-European cultures, the uh, Southeast Asian cultures, and the Aboriginal cu cultures of uh, Australia, and so on. I'm curious, of course, what was so terrifying about Anjali? Uh, that your friend reported. Uh, perhaps that links to a broader question. Do do these sorts of uh, entities, if you like, from these sorts of realms, uh, is it possible for them to have an influence on us, on our states of mind, or on our circumstances, and so on? And um, you know, what what are the consequences of encountering such uh, such beings? Yeah. Yeah, I would say definitely there is an effect definitely on the mind and there is an effect in the form of influence in so far as, you know, you hear stories of yogis who encounter certain entities, encounter certain nagas. I mean, the nagas, for example, are a very important element uh, in the yogic tradition. You know, for example, in the, in the yogic tradition, the idea is before you had the Vedic gods, before you had the Norse gods, before you had all of these uh, different gods, you had the Typhonic gods, which were like the gods of ancient Egypt and so on. But even before that, there was worship of the Nagas. And so the mythology behind that is that the yogis, they've passed on these stories in the Himalayas, that the idea is the Nagas came from a different dimension. They came here to earth or this earth plane to start to teach the, the people here, the beings here, certain ideas, certain notions, certain techniques, and so on. And, uh, and so there is reverence given to the Nagas, not only in the yogic tradition, because you see, for example, the, the, the icon of Shiva, and you see the snake around his uh, neck, but the snake, you know, it's basically 
representing the Naga. And what it's saying is the Naga also is a lord of the yogis. It's Naga also is a teacher of the yogis, just like Patanjali is. So the reverence given to these snakes, snake beings, uh, reverence given to the Nagas, the idea is snakes are a devolved form of the Nagas. So the Nagas are, you know, reptilian in nature. We talk about reptilian entities. Those are what really Nagas are. And you see snake worship all throughout different cultures. You see it again, you know, in ancient Greece, ancient Rome, ancient India, ancient China, wherever you go, you see some form or another, even in Mesoamerica, uh, you know, you have the Aztec and Mayan religion and so on. So again, that's pointing out, you know, there is something to be said about these experiences. Now, as to what they look like or how they are perceived, the way I understand it is there is, there, there is a way that they're perceived and there's a way that they actually look. So what I mean by that is when you talk about like devas, you know, you talk about like the, the angelic beings, they, they, they possibly look differently than the way humans interpret them. So they might just be in the beginning, just like balls of light or spheres of light. But because of the cultural imprint in the mind, it projects onto that, that this is an angel from heaven, or this is a deva from this deva loka, or this is a god from this particular realm. You know? so, so I think there is no universal form for these entities, at least from the deva realms onward. Uh, there's no common form, but I, I see them as being seen based on the projections of culture, based on how the mind interprets them. And potentially. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I really wonder, I mean, I, I would, I would want to ask that individual, but according to him, the way he saw Patanjali was the snake being, uh, it was humanoid in form, but he had very reptilian features. So he had like snake-like eyes and uh, scaly skin and so on and so forth. And, and it just scared him because he didn't expect that. Mm -hmm. It was like having what you could say, like a dragon in the room or something, you know. You mentioned the Nagas there coming from another dimension to teach various notions and techniques. Uh, what sort of notions and techniques? Yeah, so what we're talking about is like specifically Kundalini Yoga, Kundalini Kriya Yoga, for example. Uh, talking about, you know, you hark back to uh, Shaivism, because this is really rooted in the Shaivic, Shaiv Shaivite yogic tradition, which is to say that, you know, any kind of technique that you experience in the way of certain pranayama techniques, certain kinds of breathing techniques, uh, certain kinds of energy manipulation techniques with Kriya Yoga and so on, these are all attributed to the Nagas in one way or another. Interesting. So I mentioned before that um, sometimes when you talk about these realms, although actually a little less so the way you presented it here, um, there, there is very much a sort of first person language used, uh, personal experience. Um, given that you've presented these realms now as, and presumably its occupants, as both uh, places and beings, you know, so to say, but also as uh, mind states or, or thought forms and so on. So one can sort of see, look at them in, in both of those ways. Um, what is your experience of these realms? Of course, from the meditative point of view, from the Janic point of view, we know you've, you, what you've said about your experience there. So presumably one, you've gone to all of those realms, meditatively speaking, uh, <laughs> in, in terms of jhanas and so on, you've done those jhanas. Yeah. So, so yeah. That, that goes without saying. Um, um, do you have any other experience of them, uh, a sense of having traveled there? So I'm thinking, as I ask you, I'm thinking, of course, of, uh, you know, astral travel, uh, Castaneda, right. uh, things like that, or in fact, dreams, uh, some people travel there in dreams and so on and so forth, or, or deep meditative states of absorption where one can enter into certain, uh, you know, Buddha realms and heavens and so on uh, directly. And it's said to be, yes, a, a mental state, but also a means of uh, translocation, of going right. to a different place also. Um, yeah. So I'm thinking more of that side of things. H have you much experience of that? Yeah. Well, when I was doing the experience of uh, going through past rebirths, the second part of that is actually being able to see what those rebirths and where they were. 
So they weren't just, let's say, on this earth plane. They weren't just in the human existence. They were in the hell realms. They were in the hungry ghost realms. They were in the animal realms. They were in the deva planes and so on. So I will say that my experience of that, you could say, you could equate that to astral traveling. The understanding is within Buddhism, it's talked about the mind-made body, which is a body that essentially is an astral body. And so you then are able to perceive other kinds of entities, other kinds of beings and so on. So there is experience both on the meditative uh, plane in terms of the jhanas, but there's also an experience of actually being able to communicate with these beings, being able to communicate with these different uh, entities. Uh, but I would still say that it is still on the mental level. And what I mean by that is like, when you talk about translocation, I'm not saying that physically traveling with your physical body to these locations, but rather taking that mind-made body, that astral body, and then actually moving in that realm. Like lucid dreaming, that's, that's that kind of uh, right, experience could, of one's body. Yeah. Right, you could say that, that it's like that. It's basically, that's the reason why I gave that caution, which is you start off with the four jhana because you need that deep level of equanimity. So the way I've done this practice, whether it was going through past rebirths or looking at these different beings uh, is first going into the four jhana and then the mind opens up uh, what is known as the divine eye, so to speak. So it opens up another astral uh, realm. It opens up an astral eye or however you want to look at it. And it's able to change what it's seeing visually and then able to then see larger into that spectrum uh, of what we normally see. And then you are introduced to these different beings coming and going. And so the way you look at it is, you know, you look at the different karmic streams, at least this is the way my mind, let's say, has interpreted it when I saw it, is like these different links, different rivers of karma. And it's quite possible, linking back to my experience with the cobbler, that the reason I see it in this way is because of that, because you can see different karmic streams. So in these karmic streams, you're starting to see the arising and passing away of different beings, whether they are in the Deva Lokas or whether they're in the hell realms or whether they're in the Brahma Lokas. And so, you know, shameless plug, when the book comes out on dependent origination, one of them, uh, one of the chapters is about uh, the different types of birth. So whatever is written there is based on one's research from certain texts, but also certain elements that I include there are from experience. For example, you know, the different types of body that they might have, the different types of nervous systems that they might have, the different kinds of sense bases that they might have, how do they experience reality and things like that. This is from my subjective experience. And, you know, for whatever it's worth, you can take it or leave it. But this is what I'm saying. This is what I'm putting forth. Mm. I know we're coming to the end of our time. I think we'll wrap it up soon. But this has been so fascinating, Dustin. What are, what are the uh, ways in which these sorts of uh, teachings or capacities or faculties or techniques are used is to, and I've mentioned it before, to contact past masters. You mentioned Patanjali, actually, um, for example. I'm wondering if you've ever done that, if you've ever gone looking uh, for past masters, you know, Jesus or something like that. I'm actually, I'm actually interested in what you think of Jesus. Um, but uh, so maybe that's two questions. What do you think of Jesus? <laughs> that's an easy one. Ha <laughs> ha, not. Yeah. And um, have you ever gone, have you ever gone uh, searching for contact with uh, past masters? Right. So the, the experiences that I've, that I've had when it comes to past masters, let's, let's address that first, is uh, how do I put this? Because the way I've experienced it is being able to see my past lives and then being able to see certain lives in certain realms, let's say, where there might be past masters. And so past teachers, I'm able to kind of locate through my rebirths but I haven't really attempted to actually communicate with them now, wherever they might be. Uh, it would be an interesting exercise. It would be an interesting thing to experiment with and, and check out. I mean, you know, I, I would really be fascinated by being, being able to communicate with Patanjali, 
you know, uh, because being the founder of yoga or anybody, any other being who has had an impact on human history in one way or another when it comes to meditation. So, but the short answer is uh, no, I haven't actually communicated with them, but I have seen them based on uh, my experience with them in past lives. And they're not well-known past masters. I'll say that right, right up front. They're, they're, they're entities who can be extraterrestrial in nature. So, so one of the lives, for example, was in this plane of existence, which was sort of like a school. And it was sort of like a, a, a school of different kinds of beings there. So it was almost like it was an interdimensional school if you will. And so one of the masters that I knew or was under uh, learning under the tutelage of is uh, this alien like being actually, at least my interpretation of him in my subjective mind, or of that person or that being is alien in nature. And I, I realized that could be because of the way I projected my idea of what that person is. So they're not necessarily known or well known. Um, as far as I know, uh, my one of my mentors, the person Greg Halpern, uh, he he talks about his communication with uh, beings from the Pleiades system. You know, so he has contact with those uh, particular entities, and you know, he he has a lot of different stories about that and different uh, you know wisdom tales of what the experience is like and technology and and things like that. So, like I said, the short answer is no, but I wouldn't be, I would be open to trying it out and seeing if I could access uh, uh, past masters. Now, as for the story or the, the idea or the uh, question about Jesus, the way I perceive Jesus is I see him um, not in the same way as we understand him through the Bible completely. I believe you know, any of the texts that we have in any kind of spiritual tradition has some level of corruption, some level, and not necessarily a nefarious intention of corruption, but you think about, you know, you know, the game of telephone, you know, it, you have just 10 people and the words are misinterpreted or misheard, but the oral traditions might, might not always be pristine. And then likewise, when you have people writing down you know, stories about Jesus or other beings and things like that, they might not always be accurate because they, they've been written after many, many, many years or even centuries after that individual has gone. I do see Jesus as being um, an explorer of the psychic realm, an explorer of spirituality. I see Jesus as being somebody who had some influence from yoga, but I, I, I don't know if I want to say that he traveled to India necessarily. And the reason I say that is because at that time, let's say we, we, if we consider at that time when he was alive, that period was a period of a lot of cultural trade. So my impression or my idea, for whatever it's worth, is that he encountered different monks and different traditions and different yogis who traveled you know, on their way to Greece or on their way to somewhere else from India and vice versa. So I believe he probably had the encounter with certain individuals who had certain wisdom and he was fascinated by that. And what I'm fascinated by Jesus is his emphasis on the power of forgiveness. Because in um, the twin community, in, in the twin practice, there is in another practice which is known as a forgiveness practice. And it's a very cathartic practice for a lot of individuals who aren't able to do the general practice of sending metta or loving kindness. It opens up their heart. So I believe Jesus's greatest contribution is the understanding of forgiveness and the power of forgiveness. And primarily not forgiving, not just forgiving others, but forgiving oneself, you know? So, so whether he did miracles or not, or whether he claimed certain things or not, that might be true, that might not be true. But my impression of this, based on my understanding of yoga and the Buddhist tradition and so on, is that he definitely had some encounters. He definitely had some influence. 
but I, I caution myself to say that he might have gone to India. I don't know if that would be accurate to say. Well, Dalson, this has been uh, really remarkable and uh, uh, conversation, I think, going into all sorts of uh, weird and wonderful places. Um, <laughs> what haven't I asked you or haven't we talked about that? Uh, does anything come to mind um, that we ought to say as we're now reaching the end of our interview? Uh, I mean, there's so much to explore, really. I mean, we, we can talk about a lot of things uh, in terms of just different meditative practices and things like that. But, you know, one of the things that uh, we could talk about, maybe, I don't know if you could talk about it briefly, but it is something that is a very fascinating subject. I believe you did it recently with uh, Lee Brasington, which is dependent origination, because dependent origination is such a vast and profound a subject that ought to have its own sort of exploration um, for people to really understand how is it that we actually perceive reality? How is it that karma comes to be? Because dependent origination is really the mechanics uh, or the mechanism, let's say, the gears that move the wheel of rebirth, that move the wheel of samsara. So that might be something worth exploring. Either. Well, perhaps I can tempt you back for a third installment <laughs> focused on that. Would you be willing to do that? Sure. Oh, terrific. Well, Dalson Armstrong, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to another Guru Viking podcast. For more interviews like these, as well as articles, videos, and guided meditations, visit www.guruviking.com.